How many of you out there kind of had your head bumped in a little bit at some point, right? You know, I did. the first week we got it, I'm like, this is awesome. Like, we, we need this song every time before somebody preaches. It's great. And, and, it's, and it's actually kind of fitting that we get into Judges and you guys are kind of bumping your head because Judges is a very head-moving book of the Bible. There, there's many times in Judges we read it, we're like, yeah, go God, go God. Let's see what God's doing. And then other times we're like, we're like scratching our head like, what? what's going on here? This just doesn't make sense. And then we get to the point where, like, you see what's about to happen, and you're like, no, no, you're shaking your head, no, like, don't do this. And then finally you drop your head. It's like, oh, God, that happened, right? Judges is a very head-bumping book to read. And, and we talked about the cycle of Judges you know, for the last few weeks, where Judges is very cyclical in the fact that the, the people of Israel start off, and they're in misery, and they're in bondage, and they cry out to God because they need a Savior, Right? And so God sends them a judge or a warrior to be that, that savior mentality. And then God takes them through, and, and all of a sudden they're very victorious over their enemies. And then they have a time of peace and prosperity. And then they do something stupid, and they fall back into sin. And then all of a sudden they cry back out to God because they need help. And it's this very cyclical pattern that goes on in the book of Judges. And there's many times we read this book, and we're like, what are they doing? I don't understand why they continue to do the things that they do. When we start shaking our head, and sometimes we can't even get the words out. It reminds me when I was in, in high school, my, my best friend Bobby and I, we would hang out together all the time. And so for some reason, I was always the driver. I'm not sure how that worked out. But I was always the driver when we would go places. And so I remember we would go to the, uh, the ice cream place. I and mean, we had two in our town, but we really only had one, right? There was two, but we really only had one. And so we went to the one that was on the main drag, and we just had a lot of fun. And so we would go, and we had that head bump and moment, like, yeah, this is, this is great, this is fun. And so we went this one time, and all of a sudden we got back in the car, we're having fun, we're laughing, we're doing whatever we do. And we get in the car, and I turn on the car, and it's my car. It was a 1990 Ford Tempo, okay, the kind you pretty much had to crank every time you wanted to get it going. All right, that was my car. And so we get in the car, and all of a sudden I'm, I'm sitting there, got the car on, and Bobby's in the passenger seat, and he looks over, and there's this guy that's backing up his car. And he has no idea that I'm parked right behind him. And so as he's backing up this car, the, the, the most profound words out of my best friend's mouth was, who did it, who did it, oh, and we got hit, right? It was one of those moments. You, you, like you see the car wreck happening and you can't say anything about it because it goes so fast and so slow at the same time. And his, his verbiage was awesome, right? And it's what I think of when I think of reading Judges. I'm reading the book and we're having a great time and all of a sudden you're like, who did it, who did it, oh, that happened, right? And we're going to have some of those moments when we read through Judges, and not just this last couple of weeks, but we're going to see that as we go on and on in Judges, where things happen, and you're thinking this is going to be great. God's got a plan, and it's all going to work out, and then you shake your head, and you're like, why is this happening? And as people who are standing on this side of history, we can read Judges, and we can become a judge of the Judges, if we really want but I don't think that's wise. I think actually the way we need to read Judges is to actually get to a point where we interject ourselves into the story. I don't mean interject ourselves in the story in such a manner of, hey, what would I do if I was in this situation? But hey, I'm reading Judges, and there's actually a lot to learn from this. And so how does Judges affect how I live my life? Right? So as we read through Judges, I want it to highlight our own lives. Because in doing that, then we can see not only is this a book of history that we can learn what God is doing, but also we can learn from this through Scripture, and God can speak through Scripture. See, God doesn't just speak through the New Testament. God speaks through the Old Testament as well. And when we take that and we read it in such a manner, we get to understand what God is doing then and how it affects our lives today. Last week, Brady talked about how the Israelites were being oppressed by the Canaanites. But ultimately, God came in. And he crushed the Canaanites through uh, Barak and through Deborah, the prophetess. And it was a great story, right, that, that we had through there. And every story that we start off with a new judge kind of starts the same. And what we're going to do is we're going to get into Judges 6. If you have your Bible journals, go ahead and open up into Judges 6. There's a pencil in front of you if you want to grab that to write or your own pens or whatever you want to do. Um, you can probably take some notes. I do not have any slides up on the screen. So pretty much whatever hits you, write it. Okay, whatever hits you, write it. I don't have a, uh, this specific thing for you guys to write down uh, today. So as we're going to get into this story, we're going to get into a story about a guy named Gideon. 
And what's really cool about Gideon is Gideon is listed in Hebrews chapter 11 as one of the great men of faith. Right, Hebrews chapter 11. It's like this, this, they call it the hall of faith, right? Not the hall of fame, but the hall of faith. And as, as I read through the, the, the Hebrews chapter 11, sometimes I sit there and wonder, why were they considered one of the great people of faith? It challenges sometimes my vision of great people of faith. You see, I feel like in my life, I know people that I would put on a pedestal in a, in a manner to say, wow, that is a person who is walking in faith. But then I look at the, the, the Bible and I see half the list of there. I'm like, man, that guy is jacked up, right? Why are they part of the great people of faith? We can ask God that someday, right? But they were. And Gideon is one of those people. And so as we get into Judges chapter 6, I want us to kind of figure out, hey, why is Gideon one of these great people of faith? And what can I you and I learn from that story. So if you would, let's just enter a time of prayer, and then we're going to dive into the scripture. God, thank you so much for giving us the ability to read through your word and your scripture. Lord, I pray that sometime as we read the Old Testament, God, it just it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit our culture. It doesn't fit our lifestyle. It doesn't fit our mentality, Lord. But yet, truth is in the scripture. And I am praying, God, that you would open our eyes and reveal to us the truth of your scripture as we roll on. We ask all this in your name. Amen. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just kind of start us into Judges 6. And I'm, going to, I'm not going to read through the whole book. We got three chapters to get through, and thankfully for your sake, I'm not reading through it all, okay? Because I want to kind of highlight the beginning of it and, and how the wars and all that kind of stuff go. It doesn't totally matter for this message series itself, but we're going to get into it, and we're going to fast forward here there. So I'm going to set the scene of what's going on. Right now, we've got Judges chapter 6, and we just, again, we talked about in, in chapter 5 that Barak and, and Deborah, and they came, and they, God wiped out the Canaanites, and then here comes on the scene another nation that is uh, harassing the Israelite people. And the reality is the reason that they're harassing them is because as we read earlier in the book of Judges chapter 1, they did not do what God told them to do, and that was to eradicate these nations that were having false gods, because what would happen is if you kept them around, they would then marry with your sons and daughters, they would then interject their way of life and their beliefs, and all of a sudden you would have mass confusion. And I think it's similar in our lives, right? We, we've got a, a, a sin in our life that maybe we try to not eradicate, but maybe tamp down, and ultimately what happens is it comes back and it causes a problem and it causes a stress in our life. I don't think that these two things are separate. I think that they're very similar in the fact that we can learn from it. And so we're getting into this section, and now we've got a new nation. This nation called the Midianites, and they've got their friends called the Amalekites. Okay? Great names, right? The Midianites and the Amalekites. And they're coming on scene, but they're a little different. See, the other nations, they would come and they would enslave the Israelite people. They would, they would kill them. They would uh, put them in bondage and whatnot. But when the Midianites come onto the scene, the Bible says that they're like locusts. And the fact that when they come in, they will come in with the intent not to so much kill, but to destroy. So whatever you have, I will take. And it says that their, their armies and their camels, they were innumerable. And they would come on the scene and they would eat all of their livestock. They would take away all their cattle. They would take away anything that they had of value to make their life difficult, to make the Israelite people's life difficult. And that's a hard spot to be in. Imagine, if you would, that you were to put all your life savings into building a house, Okay. And you go to build this house, and you know that in about six months, that house is going to burn down. It just is. But you got nothing else to do. you got nowhere else to go, so you build that house. In six months, that house burns down. And the next year, you go, i got to build a house. I need some place to live. So you build a house knowing that the house is going to get burned down, right? It's degrading, isn't it? It's demoralizing. It's something you don't want to do. You just want to quit, and you want to give up. And that's the scene that we have here with the Israelite people. You see, this nation comes in, and they are like a bunch of locusts. And onto the scene comes this prophet. And this prophet starts crying out. And I'm going to read this in Judges chapter 6, verse 7. It says, And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites. And the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt, and I brought you out of the house of slavery. And I delivered you from the hands of the Egyptians and from the hands of all who oppressed you, and I drove them out before you and gave you their land. 
And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwelled. But you have not obeyed my voice. It's supposed to be encouraging to him, right? Hey, listen, guys, let me tell you what. I come from God, and God said, I'm the God of the, of the Israelite people, and I've already brought you out of bondage, and I brought you out of slavery. Remember the Red Sea? You guys crossed the Red Sea. Remember the 10 plagues? I took you through all of that, and I saved you. I took you all the way through the desert. I gave you manna. I gave you quail. I took you to Jericho. Remember Jericho? Man, you all walked around those walls, and guess what? They fell, and you conquered, and I took you all the way, and you, I brought you into this land, and you said this land was full of milk and honey, and you said the fruit was huge, and it was wonderful, and it was a great place to live. Live. And this is where I brought you. I, I put you into this place. But you kind of forgot all about that. That's not what you want to hear when you're down, is it? Like if, if you're going through a, a hard time in your marriage, and I tell you, hey, remember what God did. You, that's not what you're thinking at the time, right? That's not where your head's at. Your head is, how do I make it through this moment? Not what happened in the past. Okay, but this prophet came along and he started saying these things. And why did, why did they even need a prophet to come along and say these things? You know why? Because they didn't teach the next generation what God did for them. You see, God established this law and, and these rules. And when Passover came back in Egypt, he said, now listen, I want you guys to set aside some time. Every year we're going to have these different festivals. I want to set aside a time to remind you what I did for you. And every year I'm going to remind you. And your, your, your children, you're going to teach them the scriptures and they're going to know the scriptures and you're going to have time to repeat the scripture. Right? And guess what they didn't do? They didn't do that. And so hundreds of years later, we get to the point where there is no history to remind. That is just a thing in the past. That happened to those people. That didn't happen to us because they didn't pass along the word to our children. We get an opportunity today as believers in Christ to pass along the word of God to the next generation. And we just keep passing along. That's why our kids' services and church is so valuable and so important, not just to us as a body today, but to the future of our church and the future of our nation and the future of this world, right? We have an opportunity to shape that next generation to keep teaching them. Imagine if each one of us would have learned what our parents knew by the time they died. And then we just kept passing on. We kept growing on that. And we kept building on that. And we kept building on that. But too often we get to the point where we're reinventing the wheel every year. And our kids are asking the same questions about faith that we asked. Right? That happens, doesn't it? I hope I'm not alone in that scenario. But that happens to us, doesn't it? And so this, this prophet comes on the scene. He's trying to say, hey, since you did not teach your children, I'm going to tell you what happened back in the past. And I think that's a spot that we're in when we read Judges is there was no remembrance of what God did, let alone seven years before when he, when he wiped out the Canaanites, but yet the big history of who God is. But you know what? I don't fault the Israelite people. How often do we forget what God has done in our lives when we're in the middle of something that's hard. Huh? How often when we're in the middle of something hard do we forget what was going on, right? You're suffering financially. You know what you're not thinking about? All the steps that God did to get you to that point. You know, you, you've got problems in your marriage. You're, it's hard to remember how you became a believer in Christ and what he did for you in your life. You've got kids that are sick. You're in tension with people. It's hard to remember how you got to this point, isn't it? But yet... God wants us to remember who we are and what he's done for us. Because we sit here and we think as if what we're going through is the worst thing in our life, but yet it's probably not because you've been through something else. Right? Has anybody else experienced that? I've experienced it, and I've done it. We've forgotten all the things he's brought us through and how we've grown because of the trials. You see, we grow through trials. And that's where the Israelites are at now again. They're growing through trials. And so that, that's this one section here. That's that first 10 verses in, in Judges chapter 6. And now we get into the introduction of who Gideon is. 
And the Bible says that an angel of the Lord, this is different than the prophet, that an angel of the Lord came, and I'll just read it in chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 11. It says, now the angel of the Lord came and he sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which is a tree, and he belonged to Joash the Abizarite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide from the Midianites. Okay, so on the scene comes this angel of God, this voice of God. And he finds Gideon, and where does he find Gideon? He finds Gideon in a wine press threshing wheat. Now let me tell you something. You know what you do in a wine press? A wine press is this big pit, right, back then, and they would put the grapes in there, and they would tramp them all down, and they'd create wine in this pit. It was, it was an area that was kind of concealed, and it couldn't go anywhere. Well, you know how you thresh wheat? You go up on the fields in the open air so that when you're threshing the wheat on the rock, the chaff gets blown away, and you've got the wheat. Now listen, I'm not a wheat expert. But I did read Google, okay? <laughs> and so threshing wheat up in the air doesn't happen down in a pit in a wine press. And why was he down there? He was hiding, right? The little bit that he had, the meager portions that he had, he knew the Midianites were coming to, to ravage the whole nation and devour everything he has. So he's like, I am not going to thresh wheat up on, the, up on the ground where they can see me. I'm going to take that wheat, make it 10 times harder, go down into this wine press, and I'm going to do it down there. And so it says, on the scene walks this angel of the Lord. Verse 12, and an angel of the Lord appeared to him, and he said, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Really? Really? Like, it's not really what you want to hear. The Lord is with you. That's not what you want to hear, is it? Clearly, the Lord is not with me. <laughs> I'm in a pit. I'm threshing wheat. I'm hiding. The Midianites are ravaging my nation. What do you mean that the Lord is with me? If I'm going through struggles in my life, I lost my job, my car breaks down, my kids are sick, I go through a divorce, financially we're struggling, and you come up to me and say, hey, Kyle, the Lord is with you. I want to punch you in the face, right? Like, that's just, that's, let's just be real, right? That's reality. That's not what I want to hear when I'm in the middle of the trials. That doesn't mean the answer's wrong. It doesn't mean that's what we need to hear, but that's not what I want to hear. That's not what I want to hear. And you know what I love about Gideon, and we're going to learn this about Gideon, is he asks great questions. He asks great questions, and he's not afraid to ask the great questions. And so and it says, and Gideon said to him, these are the first words of Gideon, and he says, please, sir, <laughs> seriously, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Oh, there it is. Probably one of the best questions in all of Scripture. And it's probably the best question on the scripture because it's probably a question every one of us has asked many times in our life. If the Lord is with us, why is all this happening to us? Raise your hand if you've ever said that. Okay. We got a room full of Gideons right here, right? People who ask the real question, if the Lord is with us, why is this happening to us? That question is real. And that question is one that you are allowed to ask. King David, when he was in Psalms, in Psalms chapter 10, and in Psalms chapter 13, and in Psalms chapter 22, he said, God, why have you forsaken me? God, where are you? God, why have you abandoned me? He's in the middle of the struggle and the trial. This is the greatest king in the nation of Israel has ever had. God, why have you allowed this to happen to me? Boy, this hit, this hit home here at our church this week, didn't it? We, we know of Anthony Tuttle and his family, Stephanie, and the kids, right? Anthony is 38 years old, and he passed away. If you've been to this church in the last two years, you've walked in those doors and seen his face. And you know how you know his face? It was always radiant, wasn't it? Full of joy. I can't sit here and lie to you and tell you I know Anthony on a personal basis because I don't. But my God, was he a great uh, witness at this church just walking in those doors. And he's 38 years old, and he passed away. Now, you tell me his family's not saying, if God is with me, why are these things happening to me? Yeah, they are. I promise you they said that. I don't know it, but I promise you they have. Because we all do that. We all say that. It doesn't matter if somebody passed away or if somebody's injured or if somebody's hurting or you're struggling. You ask the question. And it's a fair question. 
Gideon's a great man of faith. And he asks a question that doesn't seem like a great man of faith should ask, right? But he's real. But he's real. And he goes on, he says, Where are all this wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midians. All those stories that happened to them, that happened to them. Where's that God now? Where's that God now? If you're at a spot like that in your life, that's okay. You're fine. You're in great company. Jesus, when he was dying on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right? Why do we sit here and think we shouldn't ask that question? I'm going to challenge you on the other side. Ask the question. Ask the question and dive into Scripture and find the answer. Find out why God does what God does. And I love seeing the angel of the Lord. He doesn't hesitate. He doesn't pander to Gideon's requests. He doesn't do any of that. No. He just says, hey, listen, let me tell you something. I, I know where you're at. I see what you're feeling. But let me tell you what God says. It says, and the Lord said to him, this is verse 14, go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midians. I'm sending you. Okay, you and I read this, and that doesn't make sense, right? This is that head scratch moment we talked about. The head scratch, like, what, what do you mean go in this might that I have? Gideon even says the same thing. He goes on the next verse. He says, what, what do you mean this might that I have? Don't you know I'm the least in my family, and my family is the least of the clans, and I am not a mighty warrior. I'm threshing wheat down in a wine press. I'm scared to death. What do you mean go in the might that I have? He says, I'm weak. I'm the smallest. I have no strength. And the angel of the Lord says, but I sen I'm sending you. But I'm weak. I can't do that. That's, I, I don't know how to do it. But it's okay. I'm sending you. Friction. We talk a lot about friction in Scripture, don't we? There's friction there, isn't it? There's friction. It reminds me in the New Testament and Paul. Paul, one of the greatest writers of the New Testament, one of the greatest men of faith. And he had ailments and he had maladies. And it says that he cried out to God to take these away. And I'm just going to read it. Paul, 2 Corinthians 12 it says, verse 8, three times I pleaded with God about my maladies that it should, be, it should leave me. But God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content. I'm content with weakness, with insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I am weak then I am strong. Quite the opposite image of a great man of faith, isn't it? But yet, when the angel of the Lord says, go in your strength, he does this because he knows God's going to get the glory, which is God's for, right? Just because we're weak doesn't mean we're not equipped to go. Just because we're weak doesn't mean we're not the right person to go through or to deal with what we're dealing with. Because when we are weak, then God is strong. As a believer in Christ, that's our hope. Romans 5, 3 through 5 says, not only, but we also glory in the, our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. And hope doesn't disappoint us or put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Suffering, struggles, and trials are real and normal. If somebody lied to you and said that when you become a believer in Christ, everything's easy, I want to apologize for them. Because that's not even close to Scripture. That's not close to what Scripture says, nor to the examples that we find in Scripture. But in our weakness, He is strong. And ultimately, God didn't make us for our own glory, He made us for His glory. Right? And so that's where we find Gideon. And you know what I love about Gideon? Again, he has great questions. He has great questions. God's showing up, and Gideon says, uh, okay, fine. I need a miracle. <laughs> fine. If that's what you want to do, if you think I'm the guy, I need a miracle. I need a miracle. Angel Lord says, okay. Here's what I want you to do. Go get the, the, the meal that you're going to prepare for me, the, the, the animal and the wheat, and you bring it here. 
And all of a sudden, he's consumed by fire. And Gideon says, surely, Lord, I will go because that miracle is answered. If you were to write down on a chart who great people of faith are, and you were to write, requires miracles to move, would that be one of your requirements for a great person of faith? It's actually not on my list. Like, the people that are great people of faith on my list don't need a miracle, right? That's the way I I think. Like, they just do. Because God said, they're like, okay, here we go. No, Gideon asked the question. And so, I think it begs for you and I, we're okay to ask the question, God, you need to show up here. You need to show me something before I move. Because I'm not sure if I'm doing this in my own strength or your strength or what's going on. And so what happened, and again, the, the, the details of the story here are not hugely important uh, as we get to the exact events of Judges 7. You can read it, or 6 and 7. But the miracle was answered, and it said, and fire sprang up from the rock, and it consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes, and Gideon said, okay. And so the angel said, here's what I need you to do, Gideon. We're going we're gonna to clean up. We're going to clean up. You need to go and cut down all those idols that, that your father has and the people in your town has. Get rid of all that stuff. And Gideon said, okay, Fine. You, you, I asked the question, you showed up, I'll go do what you say to do at nighttime. I don't really want anybody to see me what's going on, right? Because if they catch me, they might kill me and that'd be a bad day. So I'll do this at nighttime. And he did, right? But he took the steps. And I think it's important in our lives. When God shows up and we talk to God and we get revelation, whether it's through song, whether it's through scripture, whether it's through a message, whether it's through people that are working into our life, we can see the messages of God working in our life. And when God shows up, we move. We take a step. It can be a timid step. That's okay. Take a timid step. Because a timid step usually leads to more questions. More questions lead to bolder steps. And bolder steps lead to more of what God can do. Right? Just take the step. And that's what Gideon did. He took the steps. He got a sign he claimed out the idols, and he moved on. And that pattern continues. We, we know probably the most famous story. I asked my daughter yesterday. She's a six-year-old. I said, hey, well, what do you know about Gideon? Oh, you know Gideon? Let's see. Gideon had the wolf fleece outside, and when the dew came and the ground was dry, then that was a sign from God. And then it did the other way around. This was her example. And I'm like, yes, you do read your Bible, don't you? And she said, yes, I do. I said, well, that's great, right? But that's what we know about Gideon, right? Gideon says, okay, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, I'm gonna, I need more miracles now. If you need me to do more, I need more signs. And he says, God, here's what's going to happen. I tell you what, I, I, he, he apologizes. He apologizes to God. He said, God, forgive me. But if I lay this fleece on the ground, right, thinking like a, a, a wool rug, right, a sheep's rug, I guess, probably. If I lay this fleece on the ground and the ground is dry but the fleece is wet, then I'll know that you showed up. And guess what God says? Okay, and he does it, and he rolled, brings this fleece out because it got soaking wet and the ground was dry. And he said, yeah, let's, let's kind of flip that around. Let's do it again. Can we? Miracle times two, let's do a redo. And he says, right, let's mix it up a little bit. How about if the fleece is dry and the ground is wet, then I'll believe you. God says, okay, and he does it. And the ground was wet and the fleece was dry, and Midian says, okay, or Gideon, not Midian. Gideon says, okay. And what I love is that we keep going through the plan. Ask the questions, need a miracle, take the steps. Ask the question, need a miracle, take the steps. Ask the question, need a miracle, take the steps. Things are going great for Gideon. He's really rallying the people around. Matter of fact, God brings 32,000 people people to come and fight this army. 32,000 people. And what's really awesome, and we get to, this is where we get into chapter 7, it's really awesome because the angel of the Lord had told him, and he said, hey, I'm going to send you, and you guys are going to fight as one man together as an army and a unit. And we got 32,000 people, and all of a sudden, Gideon becomes this great warrior, this great leader, the guy that came from the least. He's going to become the greatest, and he's like, I got 32,000 people to wipe out this army. This is going to be awesome. And God said, yes, it is. Get rid of 99% of them. That doesn't make sense, 
right? You told me I was going to fight as one army. We were going to come as one people. I got 32,000 people. I did exactly what you said. We unified all the tribes. I don't understand, God. When you do what you say you're going to do, I do what I say I'm going to do. I walk in your path. I walk in your plan. We get all these people, and you say, get rid of 99% of them. That doesn't make sense. And God said, Gideon, let me tell you something. I'm not raising you up now so that your name can be in Hebrews 11. Okay? I'm not doing this so you get included with the great men of faith. I'm doing this for my glory now. I'm doing this for my glory. So if I tell you that you're going to get rid of 99%, guess what? I am with you. I've been with you the whole time. When it's been hard, I've been with you. When you've been desolate, I've been with you. When you've had 32,000 people, I've been with you. And guess what? When you had 3,000, I'm not leaving you. I'm going to be with you. Okay? Preach, says Margaret. But hey, listen, think of our lives and inject ourselves in this scenario, right? How many of us has lived on a very tight budget that other people look at and you say, you're crazy you're going to make it like that. Yes, I am crazy, but it's working. God's providing. I don't know how, but he is. And then we get and we have more money and get, like it's still not enough, right? But God says, I want to make sure you pro- I'm providing for you. Like, things just don't always make sense of how we make it, but we make it because God's the one that gets glory. So if we live our own lives and we're living for our glory, it usually doesn't work out. But when we try to live our lives for God's glory, things don't make sense. And that's okay because God says, I am with you. And I love that God still cares. He's not just doing it his way and forgetting about us because God comes on the scene, he tells Gideon, he's getting, listen, I, I get it. You did exactly what I said. You unified 32,000 people. You said this is going to be awesome. And I'm whittling them away by who knows how to drink, right? I'm creating my 300 men, my special forces that are going to go in here. You know, I got the Navy, Marines, the military, whatever, we're going in here. My Army Rangers are leading the case, right? But I, I know this is making you nervous, and he says in, in, chapter, in chapter 7 here, he goes, hey, go down to the camp. I'll just read it in verse 9, chapter 7. And said, the same night the Lord said to him, arise and go down to the camp. This is the camp of the Midianites, for I've given it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go into the camp with your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterwards your hand shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. And so he said, what you're going to do is you're going to go down to the camp. So Gideon takes his servant and he goes down into the camp, and they're camping outside. They're, they're like hiding outside these tents. And all of a sudden, this guy wakes up, and he goes, man, he's inside the tent talking to his buddy. He's like, dude, I got this dream. I got this dream that we're about to get wiped out, and there's this guy named Gideon. And Gideon's the guy going to do it. And Gideon's like, okay. God said he's going to show up. I have confidence. So you see, God provides people in our lives to reaffirm what we're doing. If you are not an encourager to other people, I want to challenge you to be one right? If you have an opportunity to talk into somebody else's life, I want to give you an opportunity. I want to challenge you to do that. I want to challenge you to do that. You know why? Because you don't know if your words are the difference to make them have confidence in what God's about to do in their life or a step that they're about to make, right? I just ask that you pray about the option and the opportunity to speak into somebody else's life. You never know what difference you're going to make and how you're going to solidify a decision that they're working through in their life. And we go on, and and Gideon wins the great wars for for God, and the rest of it, you can read through it, chapter 7, chapter 8. We'll get to the very end here in a minute. But it's really interesting to me that Gideon needed reassurance over and over and over and over to do God's will. But yet, I feel like we need reassurances over and over and over and over to stay in God's will, don't we? We need to remember. Do you know why Gideon needed more miracles? Because the whole nation before them kept forgetting who God was. And so, you know what? When we ask for miracles, usually it's okay. You can ask. We've got examples. But usually the reason we're asking is because we already forget what God has done for us. We forget what God has done for us. I want to do something a little different this morning. Never done this before. But I want to give us an opportunity to remember what God has done in our own lives. And I want to write it down. 
And I want to write it down because I feel like if we can remember how we got to where we are, then we can see how God has showed up in our life. And we can know going forward, he's going to do it again. I've seen you do it again, right? We sang that song last week. I'll see you do it again. And so what we're going to do is if you've got your Bible journals, break them out. There's a pencil in front of you and the seat back in front of you. If you've got your phone, put them in your notes app. Heck, send yourself an email, whatever you want to do. Something where you're going to write this down. We're going to play a song. We're going to play a song. It's four minutes and 26 seconds. Kind of long, right? Kind of long. A little uncomfortable. That's okay. And I want you to write down the times in your life that God showed up. Because what I can promise you is there's more times in your life you don't know about that God worked behind the scenes. But I want you to show, write down when God showed up. Maybe who he provided. Maybe what he provided. Maybe the miracle that happened. You were sick and now you're healed. Whatever it was, write it down. The song is, is, gonna, is called Here Again. And it talks about, hey, will you meet me here again, God? Meet me here again. And it goes on and it says, and not for a moment was I forsaken because the Lord is in this place. And so we're going to go and play that song. Go ahead and get your books out, your journals out, and let's write what God has done in your life. I hope that was a great exercise for you to write down. As I started writing, I just kept writing. It just kept coming and flowing. Of all the things that God has done for us in my life, and it's pretty awesome, right? And I hope, I hope you have that experience as well. Because when we get to a point where life doesn't make sense, maybe we can, we can reference back to this list and keep in that judge's journal or whatever you sent that to, to say, God, I've seen you do it before and I need you to do it again, right, in my life. We had a great opportunity to talk here about Gideon and how we started off with the question, if God is with us, why are these things happening to us? Then we got to see Gideon take steps of faith, and he asked for miracles. That's okay. That's fine. Do it. Ask for the miracles. We don't need to ask for as many miracles when we continually remember what God has already done to get us to that point. But if we're somewhere in between the two, that's fine. That's okay. Ask the question. I I wish Gideon ended right there, because that whole time then we would just have a head bumping up and down yes moment. But we start to get the head shaking moment at the end. And it's a warning to us because we can get so excited about what God has done in our lives and we can see where God has taken us. And all of a sudden we start to think that maybe we did that. And God says, shoot. (laughs) Time out. Let's start this all over again. Maybe I'll get the next guy and he'll figure it out. You see, it starts off good in, in uh, Judges 8, 22. It says, the whole group of Israel came to Gideon and they said, please rule over us, you and your son and your grandson. Like, hey, you've done it so good. I want generations of Gideon decisions. And Gideon has a great words and he says, I tell you what, I, I'm not going to rule over you. You know why? And nor will my son because the Lord is going to rule over you. And I can see God going, yes, that's what I wanted. That's what I wanted. We get into the book of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, and the people want a king. And God said, no, I wasn't supposed to have a king. I'm supposed to just have the, the people love me, and I was going to be their God. Right? That's what the whole establishment was supposed to be. So Gideon was doing something great. And we're like, yeah, yeah, go Gideon. And then he said, but I tell you what. Oh, no, here it comes. All that plunder that you guys got from wiping off the people, you know, that God had us wipe out, and all the plunder that you took, I want a little bit of that. And the people said, whatever you want, take it. And it says they gave him 1,700 shekels of gold. 1,700 shekels is about 680 ounces, which in today's dollars is about $1.6 million in gold that they gave to Gideon. And Gideon took that and he fabricated it into an idol. No. Why? That stinks, doesn't it? Like he's he's in the hall of faith, man. He's like he's like in chapter eleven of Hebrews, and he did that. 
And it said and the people worshipped it. And it became a snare to Gideon and to his family. Why? But I, I promise you, you can look into somebody else's life right here. Where we're all good at being judges in other people's lives. We're really good at it. And we look at it and you go, why are you doing that? Why are you the doll going back to their vomit? Why are you doing that? Because we're people. And we're people with a sinful nature. Right? That's just who we are. So we got to keep the scripture and the word of God in front of us. All the time. All the time. To remind us of who God is and what he's done for us. Jesus told his disciples and he said, I've told you all these things that you may have peace, but in this world you will have trouble. <laughs> but take heart, I've overcome the world. If God is with us, why are these things happening to us? Jesus said they would but he's going before us. The last thing he said to the people on earth, his followers, he gives them the great commission. And in that he says, lo and behold, I will be with you even to the end of the earth. I love the Bible because it's real. We can take a book of Judges for crying out loud and we can learn from it. Because there's so much truth packed in it. And it shows us who Jesus is. He said, take heart, for I have overcome the world. The greatest miracle that Jesus gave us was being able to take away all of our sins. Greatest miracle he did. And those miracles that Gideon is asking for, right? He wants to remember who that God was. And every week we take communion. And why do we take communion every week? It's to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. Because the more we remember what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, the less we got to continually to ask for miracles in our lives. Because we will always see God moving in our lives. So if you would, would you take the, the, the packets? If you did not get one, that's fine. You can get up now. You can go in the back there by the, the table uh, when you walked in to grab one. Because we like to take communion together as a church to remember what God has done. It says in that night, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this and remember it to me. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I pray that as we can finish up our worship service today, that you would remember what God has done for you in your life. And you will move forward. Why? Because God said, I am with you. Would you go ahead and stand with me? Let's end our morning of worship together with song.